Are you glad to be in the Lord's house this morning? Uh, are you glad to be here? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, it's a beautiful day to worship the Lord this morning. We're going to begin with hymn number 15. Hymn number 15, and would you stand please as we sing all three stanzas, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, as our call to worship this morning. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, Hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel Good morning. How is everybody? I just told Ginger I think it's easier to get up here and preach than it is to do announcements. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everybody out this morning. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, we have some visitors cards and the pews in front of you. If you don't mind, if you're visiting, please fill out one of those for us so, uh, so we can have a record of your visit. Uh, got just a few quick announcements, then we'll have prayer. And then after prayer, I want everybody here to welcome somebody else. Okay, November 25th, uh, by November 25th, need to have the shoe boxes to Gary Hemrick Sunday School class so those can be delivered. And then November 29th is the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church Toy Store Work Night at the Elkin Baptist Association. It's from 7 to 9 p.m. And then December 5th through the 9th is the toy store. So if you'd like to sign up for that, I uh, want to welcome you to come do that so you can come work and, and be involved in that. It's a blessing, I'm sure. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I've never done it, and I'm looking forward to doing it this year. Uh, the West Virginia Project, it says, please help people of the West Virginia. Items can be dropped off at the church trailer, which is out close to Hank's house, uh, each Sunday morning through December 9th. And then if anyone is planning on going on a mission trip to West Virginia, it's December 14th through the 16th. Please sign up with Shane today. Uh, also, anyone interested in going to the New Mexico mission trip is June 8th through the 16th. I said 18th through the 16th this morning. So it's 8th through the 16th, and there'll be a brief meeting today immediately following the service in Michelle Marley's classroom. Uh, and the deadline to sign up is December the 2nd. And one last thing, uh, we have a list of our committees where we're needing some committee members. If you'd like to volunteer to be on one of the committees, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and it tells you what committees we're looking for members for. So uh, that's back there if you have. There's one more there if you want to. You one more. Uh, if you're a senior adult, 60 years plus, and did not get a treat bag this uh, during Sunday school, there are extras out front. Happy Thanksgiving from the Children's Department. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this day that you've given us. We're grateful to be able to be in your house to worship this morning, God. Thankful for the music that we hear, God. Just thankful that we can stand and sing to you praises of worship this morning, God. We love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. Father, I pray that you'd be with us throughout the rest of this service, God. Help us to do all things to glorify and honor your name. 
We just thank you and praise you for all that you do for us. Be with us now, God. Help us uh, as, we, as we sing praises to you, God, and help us a little bit later as we open your word, God. I pray that you would uh, work in our hearts and help us to see things that we might need to work on in our lives, God, whatever they might be. And, Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for all that you do for us, God. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. All right, I want to ask you again, everybody welcome somebody this morning. Thank you. sing together. Oh, how he loves you and me. As our ushers come forward for the offering, let's sing. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. singing this morning. All right. Uh, uh, before we pray, I would like to recognize, I think I saw Bailey Gray come in back there. Am I right? It's good to have him with us this morning. He's back there on the back. Great to see you, buddy. And then uh, also, um, I see an older man sitting over, standing over to my left, your right, who turned the big 4-0 this past <laughs> Friday. And it just so happens, that's who I'm going to call on to pray. Can you, can you still pray, Jason? <laughs> All right. He turned, he turned 40, so happy birthday to Jason. And uh, he's able to be here this morning. <laughs> Would you lead us in prayer, please?
Amen. There is a name I love to hear, and that name is Jesus. Let's continue, please, as we sing this morning, number 644, Count Your Blessings. Count your blessings, and we'll sing the first, second, and the last stanzas of this hymn. Number 644. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, See what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy? You are called to bear. Blessings every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings. over all. Count your many blessings angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, Uh, I want to take this time to um, mention our week of prayer for, uh, or rather, our Baptist Children's Home offering. Um, we uh, have a video we want to share with you. If uh, it's a it's a wonderful video, and uh, our ushers are, if you would come down the aisle, and if you would like an envelope for an offering uh, offering envelope for Baptist Children's Home, just raise your hand, and they will give you one, and you can just. Uh, turn that in at the end of the service or tonight or whenever you want to turn that in um, so that can it be counted uh, for your offering. But at this time, uh, Brother Andy, are we good to go? Let's hope so. I grew up with my mother and father um, until I was about seven because mother was a drug addict. Uh, my father was a drunk and they um, didn't mix well. And so my father moved out of the home and they separated. And so I went kind of back and forth um, between the two for a couple weeks at a time. It was not a good environment at all for me to be in. And my, my dad knew that. And he knew he, my mother was not doing a good job of taking care of me, and he knew that he wasn't doing a good job either. So he called his sister and my aunt and uncle and asked them if they would take care of me. And they very willingly agreed. So I went to live with them when I was seven years old. He started realizing that the behaviors he was learning, the currency he was learning, he was doing that so he could go back home because it was his fault, he felt. And he felt, if I learn how to control myself, how to act right in this situation, um, then I can go home never realizing that it never was about him. Once I knew what was going on and once I kind of had figured out that I was going to be there for a while and that it wasn't just a visit, um, 
it hit hard and it caused, it caused a lot of problems and a lot of pain. And when he realized that he could be the best kid in the world and it didn't change and he couldn't go home, that's when... Um, he shut down. He shut down and it was just... It was a struggle, just the most simple things. I didn't deal with it well. I would take it out on my aunt and uncle, my family there, because I felt like since I couldn't have my mom and my father really in my life, that there wasn't really a point in um, pushing for what I had. Nothing made him smile, nothing made him sad, nothing made him mad. He was just no not there. Um, and that was a very long day. Um, but at the end of that day, we, we knew that, that something had to be done for him. My psychologist, he suggested camp. We needed help, and this is where we found it. I'm addicted to wood smoke. I'm immune to ski advice. I never take a shower because I'm not full of water because I'm a cannon boy. I'm a cannon boy. You can look at it. We tell the boys when they come and, and tell the parents as well that our goal isn't to provide a home, but our goal is to provide a place where the boy can experience healing and the family can have a chance to heal and they can be reunited and back into relationship with each other. The first few months were difficult, I was quiet, but then the problems started coming out and they, got, they were really bad. It's intimidating at first. You know, you're living here for five to six weeks at a time um, with a bunch of guys with problems. <laughs> and they've all basically pretty much got the same problems you do. They, most of them have very similar home situations and dealt with some of the same issues. You know, we always say at camp, we do a lot of things to help kids and to help families, but the bottom line is, it's God's work. And when He's at work in a family and when He's at work in a boy's life, that's when we see really wonderful things happen. Camp life is different. Um, you do group work all the time. Um, you're with, you know, ten boys and you know two other chiefs almost all the time, um, from waking up to going to bed, brushing teeth, and you know, doing our meals together. My main role as a chief is to be a friend, to be there um, for Travis or any of the other guys, um, no matter what. You meet them where they're at, encourage them. That's so important, because a lot of guys don't see their potential at all. This is the kind of the love that they showed each other and showed me and the perseverance of uh, the determination that they were not going to give up on me and there was nothing I could do to make them quit um, to realize to accept them as a family. They were, they were in a family to me. Um, and they made me realize, you know, that I need to push for what I have. I need to have the passion for the family that I have. They are the kind of people that I, I can go to. I trust I can go to with anything. And I feel like I can talk to all the time all-time favorite memory in this campsite. Their strong relationship with Christ um, really showed me what I needed to do. I had been a Christian um, since I had lived with my aunt and uncle, and I had been baptized and everything, but I never really, really pushed for that kind of relationship with God, I never really had that passion for Him. So my chiefs really showed me that and what I, that's what I needed, and so we talked about it, and, that's, and when that relationship with Christ really strengthened, that's when things started getting better. Then he became the kind of person who was a leader in the group, who, who could help other boys that were struggling make progress on their goals. And so the transformation was just very, very complete. When you change Travis's life because he was here, it changed my life, my husband's life, our children, those around us, my mom, my dad church family. Our church, everybody that we know has been affected by the change in Travis because of what Baptists in North Carolina have done for us. They didn't know us. They just knew they loved God and they loved his children. God was telling me, you know, just be who you are and know who you are. And you're the person I meant you to be and to be who I really am. And just truly honestly be the person that God wants me to be is um, that was when it kind of clicked. And once you deal with your problems, and I got my problems fixed, and I was able to adjust myself to the point where I was in a good place, to be able to help the other guys, uh, that was a big deal for me. I love, I love helping people. People are a big part of my life. I have a passion for people. I don't know that I even have words that can describe um, 
the beautiful person that we knew Travis could be. He's so much more than that. And I know that being here at camp has done that. Um, and I think specifically things here at camp, not just the, the chiefs just living their lives for these boys, but churches, church families from all over the state. They come here to camp and they bring boys gifts. Or when the boys go to a church visit, they're just loved completely, like they've known these boys all their lives. Travis said to me after he was home for a homestay one time, he had been at a church visit, and he says, Aunt Karen, they really love me. I am worth being loved. Travis is just special. And Baptist Children's Home Society Cameron Boys Camp was able to pull that out of, it had been stuffed so deep down inside of him. And that's out now, and there's no stopping him. So that's the effects of our Baptist Children's Home and what it can do for our young people. And we can help uh, in our giving to the Baptist Children's Home. So if you, uh, if you would like to take part in that, just take, the, take one of the offering envelopes and uh, place your offering in it and turn that in uh, later on. We'd appreciate it very much. Well, let's continue as we sing together this morning. Hymn number 227, number 227. Praise Him, praise Him. And let's do the first and the last stanzas only of this hymn this morning. And uh, once again, would you stand as we sing this hymn? Number 227, praise Him, praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing all earth His wonderful love proclaim. Angels in glory, strength and honor, give to his holy name. By God's shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent grace. song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious power and glory unto the Lord belong praise Him praise Him tell of His excellent greatness praise Him praise Him ever in joyful song Amen Thank you. You may be seated. Let's continue to praise him as Ralph comes to sing for us. Satan just cowers to think of the powers he lost when the cross had its day. And gone are the mornings when fear without warning would win and again have its way now when satan reminds me 
of things I regret. I bring up Calvary, lest he forget. High on a mountain of sorrow and shame, grace signed my pardon as Christ took the blame. When I'm called to answer for my history, Calvary answers for me. I am now under that beautiful wonder of grace that erased all my past. And I feel the heartbeat of mercy inside me. And now I have found joy at last. I live in freedom that chains cannot bind, and I won't look back on what I've left behind. High on a mountain of sorrow and shame grace signed my pardon as christ took the blame when i'm called to answer for my history calvary answers for me Satan reminds me of things I regret. I bring up Calvary, lest he forget. I own a mountain of sorrow and shame. Grace signed my pardon as Christ took the blame. When I'm called to answer for my history, Calvary answers for me. morning. How is everybody? Good. I like sitting in the front row up here because when I get up here and actually start looking out at everybody, I'm kind of surprised at all the people. It's, it's good that I have my back to you until I get up here, I guess, because then I'd be a little bit more nervous. Uh, Wednesday night, if you was here, I, I shared a message that was entitled, Why Preach the Gospel? And uh, the scripture that I used was in Romans I'm going to be back in Romans again today, this morning. It's Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Uh, I want to share some statistics with you while you're finding your place there uh, that, that someone here at the church gave me. Uh, this says, uh, did you know in 1900, 42% of the United States was considered evangelical, while today it's only 15%. In 1960, there were 9.73 million Southern Baptists who baptized 386,469 people, a ratio of 1 to every 25 Southern Baptists. In 2011, there were 16 million Southern Baptists 
who baptized 333,341, a ratio of 1 to every 48. Last year, 20% of Southern Baptist churches did not baptize anyone. And more than 50% of our churches did not baptize a young adult between the ages of 12 and 17. So I want us this morning to be thinking about why that is. Uh, if in 1900, with half as many people, they could evangelize more people than we can in 2011, with the means that we have, with the technology that we have, the way that we have to get the gospel out, why is it that they could do a better job then than we're doing today. And we have, like I said, more people. We have, I mean, everything is at our disposal pretty much. We can, uh, we can share the gospel in many different ways, but, but yet today we're still, we're still falling behind. And, uh, and we look at the direction that our, that our nation is headed and, and how far away that we're pulling from God and, and the different things that's going on in the world today and it seems like sometimes we, we get to a point to where it's like we just, we kind of give up a little bit. You know, we say, well, I'm, I'm doing my part at church. I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, the best member that I can be at church. I'm, I'm working. I'm, I'm playing with the kids. I'm serving at church. I'm teaching Sunday school. I'm, I'm doing this. And all that stuff is great, and we need to be doing stuff. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is when we leave these church walls, when we leave this building, are we carrying everything that, that we learn and that we teach here with us out into the world? Are we evangelizing the rest of the world? Uh, today's message is going to be titled, Not Ashamed of the Gospel. And it's in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Let's look at that real quick. It says in Romans 1, chapter 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'm sorry, that was chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Uh, but I want to look at this here, what Paul's talking about. This is one of the greatest summaries of the gospel that's ever been written by man. If we look at it, I want to read it one more time. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then 17, chapter, verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. This is a, is a clear declaration of God's power and purpose in the gospel message. In these two short verses, he sums it all up for us. And he gives us a message here that we should not be ashamed of. We have no reason to be ashamed of what Jesus Christ done for us. And we should be willing to step out, step out of our comfort zones and to share that. Let me give you four reasons real quick why people in Paul's day might have been ashamed to share the gospel. The first one is the moral conditions of the day. The gospel Paul preached and its demands of repentance and holiness and, and, and living by godly standards was opposed by everything that Rome believed in. It was completely against everything that they believed in and the way that they lived in that day. The second thing is the fact that Paul was a Jew. Jews were considered by many to be a subhuman race. The gospel was a message that originated in and rose out of a Jewish background. More than likely in that day, people wouldn't, uh, non-Jewish people wouldn't come to hear a Jewish preacher preach about a Jewish Savior. And I want you to think about, while I'm telling you these four things, think about this. Ask this question at the end of each one. Did that stop Paul? Did that slow Paul down? I want you to think about that. Uh, number three, the message Paul preached was incredible and nearly beyond belief. Think of it, a, a Savior, the Savior Paul preached about was a male member of a despised Jewish race. He was, to be say, he was saying that he was the Savior of man. He was saying that he was the Son of God. And he said that he was God and man at the same time. So the, the message that Paul was preaching would, was hard for them to believe. 
uh, his death was surrounded by shame because he died on a Roman cross, which was shameful in itself. Yet in dying this shameful death, Jesus claimed to be dying for the sinners, for all of us sinners. And it wasn't enough Paul preached that, that Jesus was crucified, that he was a Jewish Savior, but that in three days after his death, he arose. See, it's, it's difficult for a prideful world to accept the things that are in the Bible a lot of times. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's hard. It's hard for a, a non-believer sometimes to believe or to understand why we believe the way that we believe or why we feel the way that we feel. It's easy for us sometimes to judge people and, and, and try to, to be quick to tell them, hey, you're going to hell. That might be the truth, but the thing about it is we need to do it in love. And we need to, we need to show this lost, dying world that we love them. We need to do that because Christ loved them. And the whole message that he had was love. And then the fourth thing is, everywhere Paul went preaching the cross, he was ridiculed, he was cast out and imprisoned. Uh, he, he had been imprisoned in Philippi. He was cast out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, mocked in Athens, called a fool in Corinth, stoned in Galatia. Yet Paul remained eager to preach the word. Paul was happy to preach the word because he wanted these people that he was preaching God's word to to see that the message that he was bringing them, he believed in it so much that he was willing to sacrifice his life to suffer whatever he had to suffer because he knew that the message that he was bringing them was the truth. So when, when we step out and when we witness to somebody or talk to somebody, do we think about that? Do we think about that we're willing to face whatever persecution that we might face, which is very minimal compared to what Paul faced. It's very minimal compared to what a lot of other people in the world faces. See, we've got it pretty good here in the United States. Uh, we have our freedom of speech. We can carry our Bible. We can, uh, there's a lot of things. We can come here today and worship without worrying about somebody coming in the door with a gun and, and trying to kill us. See, there's people in other countries, in, in other parts of the world that they know that, but guess what? They're there anyway. Because they know that the message that they're hearing, and they know that what God has done for them, that they know that Jesus died on the cross for them, and they're willing to take that chance. They're willing to make that sacrifice. Because they know that the message that, that they're hearing and that they're sharing is something that they believe in. And it's something that they're not ashamed of. So now, now I've told you some reasons that people might have been ashamed of the message back in Paul's day. I want to share with you here in just a minute uh, some of the marks of the gospel. But first, I, I want to share, uh, Paul reminds us in these verses that we have a gospel to be proud of. I want you to see that the message of Jesus Christ is a message that we should share everywhere any time, with anyone, without fear, and without shame. Because the message that we have is a message that we should not be ashamed of. Because what Jesus Christ done for us. The least that we can do is tell somebody that we see at a gas station, hey, Jesus loves you, and let me share with you what he done for me. They might not want to hear it now. I'm saying follow them around and, and make them listen to you because you can't. But if they say, okay, then there's your door, there's your opportunity, there's your chance to tell somebody what God done for you. And that might be all it takes for that one person. You plant that seed, and that one person starts wondering, why, why would they care enough to come tell me? And, and you can say, well, I care enough to come tell you because I know that if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then your eternity is going to be spent in hell. And I love you enough to tell you that. And Jesus Christ loved you enough to die on the cross for you, to make sure that you didn't have to suffer that. Now again, we can't make people believe that. We can't make people understand it. 
it's, it's not our job to make them believe it. It's our job to share it with them and let God work on them and let the Holy Spirit deal with them. Let me share with you a few marks about the gospel here that makes it a message not to be ashamed of. The first is the gospel is marked by a sovereign power. See, God could have revealed... My Bible's going to slide off here. God could have revealed His power against sin in any way that He wanted to. Why? Because He is the all-powerful, almighty God. He could have wiped us out. He could have just said, I'm not worried about it, and just let us go to hell. See, I'm thankful that He didn't do that. I'm thankful that God loved me enough first that He sent His Son, wrapped in love, to die for me. Not because I'm worth it, not because I'm worthy, but because He loved me. See, nowhere is the power of God revealed or more visible than in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Again, He could have sent us to hell. Instead, He sent His Son to die for us. But notice Paul's message is the gospel of Christ. And there are many different messages that are being preached in, in our world today. Uh, we have the gospel of religion that says, turn over a new leaf. There's the gospel of materialism that says, your worth is determined by what you have. Gain is the goal of life. There's the gospel of liberalism that says, I'm okay, you're okay. God accepts us like we are. And if we're good enough, He'll take us to heaven if there is a heaven. And then there's the gospel of society that says, Do as you please, because life is short. How many times have you heard that? Now, I'm going to live my life the way I want to, because life's too short not to. But you see, listen to Paul's message. It, on the other hand, says that you're a sinner. He's pretty straightforward with it. He says, you're a sinner. If you die in your sins, you're going to hell. However, God loved you enough that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for you. And He died for your sins. And if you'll place your faith in Him and trust in Him and accept Him as your Savior, then you'll be saved. See, the gospel message, when you, when you look at it, it's really a simple message. It's a simple message with a profound amount of power in it, a profound amount of love in it, but it's a simple message. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then listen to Romans 4, 25. It states it in even fewer words. It says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So the gospel, when we look at it, is really a simple message. Like I said, I'm not belittling the message because it's a profound message with a profound amount of power and a profound amount of love in it. But it should be easy for us as His children to want to share that. It should be easy for us as His children to go and to share that with everyone, all the time. The second thing, the gospel is marked by a singular purpose. Why did God go to such great lengths for fallen sinners? Why did He send His Son to die for our sins? It's a simple answer. It's because He loved us. That's not the only reason. You see, the gospel message, is the purpose of it is giving salvation. Listen to what salvation means. It's safety, preserva preservation, deliverance. And it carries the idea of being rescued from harm and danger. See, God desires to see sinners delivered from our spiritual death, from our spiritual defilement, from our spiritual deception, and from our spiritual destruction. So the primary purpose of the gospel message is salvation for the lost which at one point was all of us. What we need to keep in mind is that right now it's a, there's a lost and dying world out there 
that if we don't share Jesus with them, nobody's going to. Because you know just as well as I do that the devil's not going to send somebody out to witness to somebody and tell them how good God is and how God can change their life and what God can do for them. So folks, what I'm saying is we've got a job to do. Again, I look at these statistics that, that I read to you earlier and it, it kind of blows my mind because of what we have at our fingertips and, and how we can reach people and how blessed we are and all the things that we can be doing, but are we doing them? Are we doing everything that we can to get God's message out, to share the gospel with everybody? Now, we, we have families, we have friends, we have jobs. So I'm not saying that you need to quit your job and, and go into the full-time missionary role. I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is that through our everyday life and our normal routine of life, there are countless people that we come in contact with that we can share the gospel with every single day. So are we doing it? Are you taking advantage of those people that you run into at the gas station, in the restaurants, at work? The second thing is the gospel is marked by a singular... I just did that. The third thing is the gospel is marked by a simple plan. Verse 16 tells us that the gospel of salvation is to everyone that believeth. So salvation is a product of faith and faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, this is the point where I think a lot of people begin to stumble. They, they kind of, if, if you're kind of like me, you like to be in control of things in your life. You want to make sure that you know what's going to happen next. Before you jump into a situation, you want to have an idea of what's going to happen next. See, if, if we're living by faith and God calls us to do something, it doesn't matter what's going to happen next. Because if God calls us to do it, He's going he's to make everything all right for you. He's going to prepare a way. He's going to set it all up. So if we're living by faith and we step out on faith, then we've got to let go. We've got to let go and let God take control. You see, salvation comes to a person who is willing to simply receive the message of Christ. Listen at John 6, 47. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And then John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And then in Acts 16, 31, it says, They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So it's a simple plan. It's, it's by faith. And then the fourth thing is the gospel is marked by a solemn pledge. You see, the, the great saving gospel for every person is, is for every person in the world. No one is beyond the reach of the gospel of grace. Listen to Revelations twenty two seventeen. It says, uh, in the, la in the latter part of that verse, it says, And whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. And then in John 6, 37, it says, all that, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. See, these verses make it clear that salvation is, is there for everyone, regardless, regardless of their race, their social standings, their education, or anything, there's nothing that can come in between. So, there's nothing that makes anyone else any better than anyone. There's nobody that's, that doesn't deserve the gospel of Jesus Christ, does, doesn't deserve to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me put it like that. But the only thing that can stop them is the sin of unbelief. Listen to John eight twenty four. It says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So the, the pledge of the gospel is for every man everywhere. The fifth thing is the gospel is marked by a satisfying payoff. The product of the gospel is righteousness. You see, a lot of times as men and women, we kind of think that we can, we can be good enough. And that's something that we hear a lot in the world. You, uh, 
You talk to somebody and ask them if they know Jesus as their Savior or if they are, if you just simply ask them if they're going to heaven and probably, I don't know, but probably 70% of the people might say, I'm, I think I'm good enough. I think I'm good enough to go to heaven. I think I've done enough good. See, that's where we have to step in and say, listen, brother, listen, sister, this is not being good enough doesn't get you to heaven. And we've got to let them know that, that the only way that they can get to heaven is by accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, so we've got to step out and we've got to do that. But, but again, the payoff, he, he is absolutely, man is absolutely wrong in thinking that he is righteous. We cannot produce righteousness, again, by self-will or by our own works. It's, it's only when faith is placed in the gospel message and, and we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Then, then, declare, then God declares us righteous. Again, it's nothing that we've done. It's all God. It's when man cannot, what man cannot do by his own efforts, God does by his power. In Romans 8, 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And then, in verse 17, the, the phrase, what does the phrase faith to faith mean? It simply refers to the fact that believers, a believer's life is to be lived in by faith, to be lived out by faith in God. As a believer lives day by day, again, the righteousness, us living day by day, God, He, he gives us that righteousness. In building a relationship with Him and in reading God's Word and we build that fellowship, that's when we become more righteous. It's when we get closer to God and we begin to act more like Jesus did and we begin to love people and we begin to carry ourselves and begin to do things like Jesus did. So God is revealed in a believer's life from the beginning of faith to the end of faith. So we have a gospel here before us that, that we have no reason to be ashamed of. There, there's no reason that we should be ashamed of anything in this book. So as we're bringing these thoughts together, I want to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is the, is the most important because if you don't know the answer to this question, then you cannot effectively be a witness and you cannot effectively serve God. The first question is, is are you trusting the gospel of Christ for your salvation? See, if, if we don't know that for sure for ourselves, how can we tell somebody about something we know nothing about? If you've never experienced that for yourself, you can't share it with somebody, and you can't tell people what God's done in your life, and you can't tell people about the changes that have been made in your life. We're not going to have, all of us aren't going to have the same changes in our lives. Not all of us has lived like Paul did. You look back at the changes that were made in his life, he was persecuting the church and killing everyone that he could that was trying to proclaim the gospel, and then he turns around in one day, meets Jesus Christ, he turns around and he's a changed man. And then he's the one being persecuted. So, you know, you might look at your own life and say, well, my life didn't really change that much. Well, if, if you were living a life that you thought was good and you thought you were doing the best that you could and you were trying to walk with God but you wasn't saved at that time and, and then you, be, you become saved, then your life's not going to change that much. There's going to be some changes in your heart. And the biggest change and the most important change is your eternal destiny is going to be changed. The second one is, are you sharing the gospel like Paul did? Now, I can't stand up here and tell you that I'm sharing the gospel like Paul did because I can tell you times in my life when I go home at night and I, I lay in the bed and sometimes I think, why did I not take advantage of the opportunity that God gave me today to witness to this person? Uh, whether it be just running into somebody at the hospital or, or standing in an elevator with somebody. And, why did I not share with that person? Because I don't know if they were saved. So why did I not take the opportunity that God gave me to ask them? Was I too prideful? Was I afraid of their answer? 
Was I ashamed of the gospel? The third thing is, well, there you go. I just said it. Are you ashamed of the gospel? The same message that was able to save then can save now. The same power that worked in Paul's day is the same power that's working in our day. You see, I've heard a lot of people talk about how uh, not seeing the same number of people saved, just like the, st the statistics that I read earlier, uh, not seeing all these people saved and not, not seeing... Well, what's changed? It's not God. God hasn't changed. Have we as His church changed? Are we as persistent as, as maybe we once was? So what's changed? See, it's, it's amazing to me that, that God has chosen us, redeemed sinners, to carry His message to the world. A message that's this important, God, God chose us. And you see, this another thing that's amazing... Listen to this. Uh, it's amazing that he would give us his gospel and then command us to take it to the world, knowing that no one is ever saved apart from the preaching of the gospel. No one is ever saved apart from hearing the gospel. Listen to 1 Corinthians one twenty one. It says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of men, by the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. And then Romans 10, 13, and 14, and then verse 17, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how then shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how then shall they hear without a preacher? And then verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So that's it, folks. He's picked, he's chose us to carry his message. He's chose us to let everybody else know. Again, the all-powerful, almighty God of the universe picked us. He's got thousands of angels that could be doing this. Why not pick them? He picked us. He chose us. So are we doing it? Are we doing what God's called us to do? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to harp on anybody here. I'm not trying to say that you're not. I'm sharing with you what God's laid on my heart. And I've said this before. Maybe all of this was for me because I know I'm not doing everything that I should be doing. I know that I'm not putting in everything that I could put in. So maybe all this is for me. And if it is, that's okay because it's been a blessing to me. And, and it's helped me to learn. A couple more questions. How, how are you doing when it comes to sharing that message? Who do you know in your own life? Is it a co-worker? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Who do you know in your own life that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior? And then... What's stopping you? What, what's stopping you from coming to the altar today, this morning, coming to the altar and asking God to give you an opportunity to talk to that person? Asking God to give you the strength, asking God to give you the knowledge, the wisdom to go to that person and let the Holy Spirit lead you and, and witness to that person and tell them about what Jesus done for you. I guarantee you that everybody in here knows somebody or has come across somebody at least this week, if not yesterday that don't know Jesus as their Savior. So what's stopping us? What's stopping us? Is it, is it shame? Is it our pride? You see, it's, we have a, an extreme urgency to share the gospel because we don't know when our last breath might be. We don't know when Jesus Christ is going to come back and take us out of here. Now, that'll be good for all of us that are believers, but what about everybody else that's left behind? Is there going to be someone left behind that you could have shared the gospel with, that I could have shared the gospel with, and didn't? Because I was afraid. Because I was ashamed. 
So you see in these verses, Paul makes it clear to us that we have no reason to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If, if we're really His children and if we're really saved, then there's going to be a desire within our hearts, within us, that makes us want to share this message. I remember when I first got saved, I wanted to tell everybody. Man, I was excited. I wanted to share that with everybody. I can't tell you that every day since then has been the same. Because if I did, I'd be lying to you. But you see, I think one, one thing that we need to be doing in our normal prayer life is that every day that we hit our knees and talk to God, we need to be saying, God, put somebody in my path that I can tell about Jesus Christ. And God, when you do that, please give me the strength in knowing that you're going to be with me. Help me to remember, God, that it's not, my, it's not up to me to save that person. All it is... All my place is to share the gospel, and you do the rest. Is that part of your normal prayer life? Do you ask God to place people in your life each day that you can share His love with, that you can share His message with? See, it's time for us to get busy. We've got a lot of work to do. I think we kind of, we kind of, sometimes we think, well, there's, this world is too far gone. It, it's, it's no use in it. I've done my part. I've been teaching Sunday school. I've been working in the nursery. I've been doing, doing this and that. And I've done my part, and this world's too far gone, so it is what it is. You ever heard that saying? I hate that saying. I hate it. But, if we have that kind of attitude and we never worry about it and we never worry about the people that we meet each day we never really sit down and think about our family members that we might have that are not saved are we praying for them? see if we can't even take enough time out of our day to pray for our own family that's lost and going to hell then, then we're definitely not going to take time out of our day to pray for a stranger that's lost and dying and going to hell So like I said, this, this, this might have been all for me because it's changed a lot of the way that I look at stuff right now. This message might have been just for me. And I thank God for it. I thank God for His Word. So I want to ask you this morning, is there anybody here, first of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then come down and let me show you in His Word how you can be saved. If you feel God tugging on your heart and you feel like that that's a decision that you need to make, that's between you and God. And I pray that if there's anyone here that hasn't made that decision, that you will make it before it's too late. Second, if, if there's anybody here and you need to come down to this altar today and you need to pray for somebody in your family, you need to pray for some of your friends, you need to pray for anyone if you need to pray for yourself, if you need someone to pray with, come talk to me. I'll be glad to pray with you this morning. I'm going to ask Hank to come, and uh, we're going to have an invitation. And I, I just want to invite you to come this morning. Don't let your pride get in the way of you coming down and talking to God. Don't let your pride get in the way of you coming down and praying for somebody that you know is lost.